Okay. Thank you everybody for joining us for this session. Um, so this is a session from the Community, community Training Programme for the Oshaw Beach Rangers. My name is Jax Keenan and I'm a Community Engagement Officer for the Oshaw Beach Rangers Project. Um, so the Oshaw Beach Rangers is a partner project between Cornwall Wildlife Trust and Cornwall College and we're funded by the National Lottery Community Fund and Our Bright Future. We're one of 31 Our Bright Futures projects across the UK aimed at getting young people aged 11 to 24 um, engaged with the environment in some way. So obviously we're very marine focused, but some of the other projects are very terrestrial. Um, so there are three sort of strands to the Yorkshire Beach Rangers project. Um, so the strand that I primarily work on is the Yorkshire Network. Um, so the logo, our jellyfish logo here, um, is uh, the tentacles are in the shape of Cornwall, which is very clever. And each of those dots is, um, is a local marine conservation group. Um, so they're run by community members. And I know some of you are, are members of those marine groups um, run by local, local people, local residents um, to look after their, um, their local marine and coastal um, wildlife and habitat. So I work with those groups, supporting them with advice um, and providing training like this. Um, and yeah, it's a great network. I think we're up to 16 or 17 groups at the moment. Um, yeah, so if you aren't a member of one of those groups and you're interested in finding out more, then just send me an email and I will put you in touch. And we also have the Beach Rangers Academy, which is um, aimed at getting uh, 16 to 24 year olds trained up, giving them life skills. So it's kind of like a Duke of Edinburgh award scheme. They do volunteering and um, they do training and they do uh, physical activity and they gain bronze, silver and gold awards. Um, and they also have mini beach rangers now, which is 11 to 16. And then there's the youth engagement aspect, which is bringing these two parts together. So um, working with young people to engage them more with their local communities and get them involved with their local community groups. Um, and yeah, so that's the three major strands of the project. Um, so yeah, this training is offered as part of the community training programme and that is given for free thanks to our funding. So thank you very much, Our Bright Future and the National Lottery Community Fund. Um, so this is just a quick map of our Yorkshire network showing the amazing, lovely and amazing marine groups all over Cornwall. Um, so in this training, I'm going to talk about a few different things. I'm also going to fully credit the fact that a lot of this, uh, a lot of the content, <laughs> I was very lucky to go to an event last month, which was also about running online events. So a lot of it is very heavily borrowed from the London Wildlife Trust. So thank you very much to them. Um, it made it much easier to put it together. <laughs> so um, any similarities are definitely they're there. Um, so we're going to look quickly at planning um, and what to think about when you're planning your event to start off with and um, different platforms that you can use and the different facilities that they have. Security and making sure you don't get Zoom bombed. Um, what to do on the day of the event and interactive tools that you can use like the Jamboard that we've looked at. So planning your event or meeting. Um, the, ideally, you want to keep it under two hours. I would say an hour and a half is probably uh, probably the maximum that I would do. Um, yeah, short and sweet is definitely best. On that note, we're probably not going to be an hour and a half today. You might be happy to hear. But um, yeah, so maximum of two hours. If you are going to do more than an hour and a half, definitely schedule it in screen break. So some of you will be familiar with Zoom fatigue and it is a real thing. Um, the, that watching a screen and watching people's faces, and particularly if you're trying to keep track of different people's faces, it, it's really tiring. Um, so if you are doing more than an hour and a half, then schedule in breaks and let people know when those are going to be. When you go on break, tell everybody to turn off their video and to turn off their sound. <laughs> so you're not hearing things that you're not supposed to hear. Um, but yeah, we, were, we had an event that was five hours long. And even though we had... We had a 10 minute break every 50 minutes it was still by the end of it that was still a little bit too much so and yeah if if it does need to be longer than that then maybe consider breaking it up into smaller sections make them as interactive as you can with smaller groups like it is today um, it's easier to sort of have a bit of more of a discussion and to allow people to unmute themselves with larger groups that's a bit trickier so we're going to i'm going to show you some tools some of you may have used already, but different ways that you can make it a bit more interactive and get a bit more engaging. 
assume that everybody is new, um, even though most of us are very familiar with some of these platforms now, um, just assume that nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> and as I've demonstrated today already, sometimes even I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so do be ready to explain everything and um, think about where things are on the screen and, and find out um, how to explain that to somebody, bearing in mind that as the host, it might look different for you. And be prepared for technical issues, such as not sharing the correct link, Jax. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's there's always going to be technical issues. Just be prepared for them. And if something's going wrong, just say sorry and, and try and work with it or work around it. Are there any questions on, on that for now? No questions in the chat. Okay, okay so. Moving on to look at different platforms, a lot of this is quite a whistle stop tour because a lot of it is just doing it and working out what happens. So what I'll also say with this is if you are planning an event and you'd like to chat a bit more about it or you're planning an event and you, you come up against a hurdle with it, then please do feel free to give me a, a shout. You have to give me an email or, or a phone call and I'd be more than happy to help. Um, but a lot of this is, I mean, everything that I've learned I've learned by doing and sometimes a baptism of fire um, with security security issues particularly so um, yeah so platform wise obviously the main one that people are really familiar with is zoom um, you do need an account to use zoom but it is free for up to 40 minutes that varies so sometimes zoom removes that 40 minute limit and um, I think they're doing it over Christmas and I think they've been doing it during lockdown and also if you, it's worth knowing that if you have an academic account, so if you're, um, if you've got an, like a college email address or a uni email address or a school, then you don't have that limit. Um, you can share your screen. There is a chat function. Um, you can add polls. They do have to be pre-planned. Um, so you can add them when you're setting up your event. Um, and you can have audience reactions. So for you guys, I think it comes up when you click on participants, you can um, do things like you can give a round of applause, you can ask somebody to speed up or to slow down, um, you can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, um, and you can ask for a coffee break. Um, I think that those are available for participants as well and not just hosts, but um, you definitely have the facility to give a thumbs up, thumbs down and a round of applause. There's also breakout rooms. So you can, um, when you've got a large group, if you want to, to encourage smaller discussions, you can split everybody off into smaller groups. It's like you're going off to different workshops and you can either do that randomly. So it just automatically puts everybody into rooms um, or you can allocate different people to different rooms if you've got specific discussions that need to be happening. Um, what I would say with that and with any online event is it's really handy to have somebody supporting you. As I say tonight, I knew it was it's quite a small group, so um, I'm doing this on my own. But usually when we're running one of these events, we'd have there's usually two of us doing it so somebody can help you with those things. Um, a background photo. So today, <laughs> today I'm in my sister's spare room. So <laughs> to, to hide all her stuff. I've got a background photo so you can um, set that up. I think it's on the, the video button um, and you can put set video background. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's quite a handy one to have and it just gives you a bit more so you don't have to worry about what's behind you so much. Um, and you can also stream to Facebook or YouTube live. I think that is only available for Zoom Pro. Um, but you, yes, with Zoom Pro, you can stream to Facebook or to YouTube, so you can stream your event straight on there. You do obviously need to check with all your attendees that they're happy to do that, so you need to let them know in the pre-event stuff. Um, so with the limit, the free to up the 40 minutes, I think it's about £12 a month to do Zoom Pro, and you can, the, the time limit is then removed. Oh, and you can link straight to Eventbrite, so if you set up your event on Zoom, and then you set up your event on Eventbrite. Um, there's now an event on Eventbrite, there's now an online event page and you can directly link your Zoom account and select the event there. So um, 
So yeah, that's quite handy and it means that people get the registration link sent out automatically and it's all secure. Microsoft Teams is another one most of you might be familiar with. Um, so it's free and um, you do have to invite participants via an email link. Um, also, if you have, I think if you have an institution or um, like an organizational email, so like we've got the wild breakfast emails, obviously, I think you can only have people as hosts if they have one of your organizational emails. It's something that we've not, we haven't really used Microsoft Teams because it, when I first started looking at them, when we started doing online events in April, it didn't, it didn't give the as much flexibility as Zoom did. You can share your screen and there is a chat function, but there's not a lot of other functionality to it. Um, and you can blur your background. You can have a picture as well, but you can also just blur your background um, for that security. Um, Google Meet is one that I haven't used myself, um, but apparently it's very similar to Zoom, but it doesn't have breakout rooms. Um, but if you have a Google, a Gmail account and you're setting up anything on your calendar, you'll see now that as soon as you invite somebody to an event, it comes up with make it a Google Meet. Um, so yeah, apparently it's, it's pretty handy, but I haven't used it myself yet. And there's also Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Um, so they, we've used those for things like Q&As. So during, the, during Shark Month, um, in April, um, Jen was doing live Q&A sessions. Again, that's something that you really want to have somebody helping you out with because you can answer questions that are coming through comments. But it's really helpful to have somebody who's, who's helping and feeding you those questions. Um, and the same with YouTube Live, you can respond to questions. But um, obviously, there's not the like, live interaction. You can't have a discussion with somebody on it. I'm just going to check the questions because I can see that there's some to come up in the chat. Um, so Joss, uh, I think with Teams, you can only choose a background if you have a paid account. Okay. Um, you can blur the background without a paid account now. So, um, okay, that is that is one tool that you have with Zoom that you don't have on Teams as well. Um, Teams is good for conferencing and it has lots of features. Tirely Teams, is that Nicola? T is a Tirely Teams? Sorry, I, don't, I have not heard of that before. Ah, oh, <laughs> just quick typing, okay. <laughs> so Teams is, a, is very good for conferencing and has lots of features like polls and surveys. Okay, that's cool. It's something that we tried right at the start of lockdown, of lockdown one, and it, it was, we couldn't, you have to set it up right. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we, I couldn't work it out and we'd already spent a lot of time getting into Zoom. So I guess it's one of those, if you've got it set up right then, and yes, it's improved. So yeah, that was in April. So I guess that they've had to compete against Zoom. Um, okay, that's good to know. Thanks, Nikki. And I'll put some of that information in the follow-up notes. Um, so the blurred background is free. I'm pretty sure it's free on Teams. Um, I don't think you have to pay to have a blurred background on Teams. I think they have. I think they have to kind of have something, an option for that. Um, Zoom, you can't blur the background, but you can have a picture in the background. I think I'm pretty sure that's free as well. But I will check that out. This is why it's handy to have somebody helping because they can take the notes for you. Thanks guys, is there, they've relaunched with new features. Thanks Nicola. So yeah, Teams has gotten much better apparently. I think I've spent so much, I invested so much time getting to know Zoom and teaching other people how to use Zoom that we've just sort of stuck with it, but it's good to know that Teams has definitely improved. Um, and I know that they've given a lot of facilities to academic institutions as well. Are there any other questions before I move on? No? Thanks for that, guys. <clears throat> so when you're looking at, at, um, at the platform and which platform you want to use, partly you're looking at what the event is and what you're trying to get out of it. Also, what you're comfortable with and familiar with. If you've never used Google Meet before, then it's probably not the best thing to do a big 
like open public event with it but if you are doing if you if it's something that you want to learn how to use and it's just a small team meeting with people that you know fairly well then that might be a good opportunity to do it but yeah if you're using it for online events either talks or workshops um, or a committee meeting or um, a public meeting that might help you decide which platform is the right thing for you and again if you're not sure and you want to discuss it then give me a shout but as you can tell it's everything's changing with them quite a lot as well like teams has obviously changed a lot since i last used it for a, tried to use it for a public event and meet google meet is pretty new so everything's evolving all the time so security anybody who came to one of our first events <laughs> which was um it was during shark month and it was collins bg who's this incredible basking shark expert and he was giving a talk about basking sharks and his research and we got zoom bombed um which meant we had something like 15 or 20 people who got into the into the event and we're sharing like she's sharing pornography on their screen and shouting at me <laughs> it was incredibly stressful but it did help me sort out the security features we'd been quite lax with security because we hadn't had any issues with it obviously because it was quite new um, but yeah, so we were we were zoom bombed. <laughs> um, okay, so different um, security settings that we've put in place since, and all of these are quite sort of well known now. But again, it was it was all very new at that point. So account settings. Um, so on thing on. So most of what I will talk about is about Zoom, but a lot of it will be pretty applicable to the other platforms as well because they have to have these security settings in place to make sure that, that it's safe for everybody to use. So on Zoom, you go to my account and then to settings. You want to make sure that your waiting room is on. So when you guys logged in, I had to go through the list and make sure that you were the right people <laughs> and you were on the registration list. Um, and then that allows me to let you in. It also gives you the facility to message people. So early on, people were coming in and there wouldn't be clearly them. Um, it might be like a number um, or something. So I would mess, you can message them directly. So I'd message them and say, can you change your name to something that I recognize? <laughs> um, so that's an added security. Um, turn the meeting passcode on. So just that you have to put a passcode in to enter the room. But with that, you need to remove. So embed passcode in invite, turn that off. So what that does is if you have the passcode embedded in the invite, then it's just it's just clicking on a link. So it's basically pointless to have their passcode in the first place. Um, so turn that off and also just turn mute all participants, turn that on. And that just saves having to tell people to mute when they enter the room. Um, OK. Um, don't share the Zoom link on social media or in any public forum. The Zoom link should only go to the people who are registered. Um, that is the mistake that we made. So people were searching on social media for Zoom and then any links that came up, they were just going on in, um, in groups and um, harassing people, <laughs> um, which is very funny now and it was incredibly stressful at the time. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so don't share the Zoom link on social media. Um, have a registration in place, and that can be something as simple as people emailing you and registering, um, and then you send them the link. Um, but as I said, you can do it through Eventbrite, um, and that sort of it removes the manual effort from you to do it. So you can link directly to Eventbrite or you can send it manually to attendees when you're doing that. If you're sending it to multiple people, obviously, just make sure that you're blind copying everybody in rather than carbon copying everybody in. Because otherwise you're breaching GDPR by sharing everybody's email addresses. And then, yeah, with the waiting rooms, just check everybody um, before they're admitted. So on Eventbrite, you can download um, a list of attendees and just check off who is arriving as um, compared to who's on the list. So as I sent out an email to you guys before the event, um, just it's good to sort of tell people then to make sure that they're very clearly the person that has signed up on the uh, on the event right booking or whatever booking that is you've done. A risk assessment is a good idea to have. So um, 
a lot of you will be familiar with risk assessments for outdoor events, but maybe not so much for online events. Um, so this is an example of the one that was provided by the London Wildlife Trust. Um, so a lot of their risk assessment is aimed at protecting young people um, or vulnerable people. Um, so it, some of it may not be applicable. I'm going to be sending this out. Um, I might send a modified version out when I send out the um, post event information. So you'll be able to adapt it um, and uh, use it as you need to. But yeah, you do still need to have an, um, an online risk assessment, basically to say that you've taken all these security measures. So things like um, for the young people that they work with, it's really important to, you know, that having a background where there might be embarrassing, something embarrassing or people seeing stuff that they shouldn't see or gleaning information from people which might make them vulnerable. Um, that's something that is really important for when you're working with young people. So I'll send the whole risk assessment out in case any of you are intending to work with young people or do work with young people, um, but some of it may not be as applicable as others. And have a co-host if possible. <laughs> So what I learned from the Colin Speedy incident when I was on my own and I was trying to manage all of the Zoom bombers who also had set their profiles to just videos, videos, um, that it was quite hard for me to be able to support Colin in doing his presentation and also manage the, the attendees. So it's a good idea to have a co-host to help you to keep an eye on the group, to monitor questions and just keep an eye on all of that. Um, and also to let you know if there's any issues because you can't see um, all the attendees when you're presenting from your screen. Um, so yeah, it is incredibly stressful and I've sadly lost the video, so I'll never be able to watch it again, which is fine. <laughs> um, there is a lock now, yes, Nicola. So you can lock the meeting um, and that is, um, let me see if I can show you. I don't know if I can because it's on Zoom. No, but I think I've got it on one of the next slides. So yeah, you can actually lock um, you can lock the meeting once everybody's in that is going to arrive. You can lock it so nobody else can get in. Um, if you've got a waiting room, it's kind of pointless anyway because you're going you you'd have to let them in, but um, it can be handy to let people know that they're not going to be able to get in. So, so we had been saying, I think right at the start, that when we put the security session sections in place, um, that after five minutes, if people didn't arrive after five minutes from the start time, then we would lock the meeting and they wouldn't be able to get in. And it was just an extra security setting. Um, is there any other questions on that? And yes, I will be, um, I will be sending the risk assessment. Okay, so um, Nicholas just said that um, that teams have videos to learn how to use their new features. So thank you very much for that. Okay, so moving on. So on the day, um, just keeping an eye on time, we're doing fine. Um, so what to do on the day? So making sure that you've shared the link and the password. As I say, if you've done it through Eventbrite, this should be, which is linked to Zoom, then this should be done automatically, but just making sure that you've sent it out. And if you are sending it by email, making sure that everybody is blind copied in. Set up your space. So um, that could be making sure that there's nothing embarrassing behind you. <laughs> it's not embarrassing, it's just full. Um, um, and making sure that it's not too distracting. So some people kind of curate their space so that all the most interesting aspects of their personality and life are behind them, which is very nice and it can be really interesting to see, but it can also be a bit distracting. So um, yeah, sometimes some people will ask everybody to turn their cameras off anyway if they're not presenting, um, or you might just wanna make sure that you've got a sort of a plain-ish background um, and that there's not going to be people wandering behind you um, and stuff. It's really nice to see some sometimes to see people's lives going on behind them because sometimes you don't you don't get to see that. But um, yeah, it's up to you. You need to decide how you're going to set up your space, and that also includes um, oh yeah, sorry, check your background and any items in view. Make sure there's nothing inappropriate, um, particularly. Upload the background photo if necessary. Choose somewhere quiet, and using headphones can be helpful with that. Um, um, it certainly stops you from being distracted from 
noises that other people might not be able to hear. Um, close unnecessary files and tabs. So particularly if you're screen sharing, make sure that you've got you've only got open what you need. And partly that is to help you manage the event. But it also means that, again, if you've got emails open and it has people's personal email addresses on them, um, that's a potential data protection issue. So make sure that that is closed. Um, uh, yeah, and let everybody that you're with know, like nobody in your house or flat know that you are running an event and to give you some space. Um, check your event settings. So this is the toolbar. It'll be slightly different for you guys today because you're participants and um, I'm the host of the event. Um, on that hosting, uh, when I said about um, making somebody a co-host if possible, um, again, that's only available for Zoom Pro. So again, it's only available if you've got the, the 12 pounds a month account. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. Um, so the security shield, um, the on the bottom toolbar, um, if you press that, then this uh, little box comes up. So the option to lock the meeting, enabling the waiting room. And then if you're if it's a small group and you're pretty confident that you know people and you trust them, then you can keep share screen on if other people are going to be presenting. As I knew I was the only person who's given the presentation today, I've not I've kept it off. Um, and you can also, you can turn off the chat option. Um, you can turn off the option for people to rename themselves if you're concerned that that might be an issue. <laughs> we locked, after the Zoom bombing, we locked all of this down because it was just, we were very, very particular and a bit worried, but it's, it's kind of, we're a bit more confident with how we run it now. Um, and you can also turn off the option to, for people to unmute themselves. So with larger events, that does happen, that like you won't be able to unmute yourself um, just for the sake of not doing it by accident, which people do all the time. If you click on participants on the bottom, um, that should, um, if you're the host, then this is what will come up. So obviously it'll be different for you guys today. Um, so if you click on participants and then in the bottom right hand corner, it says there's the three dots and then it gives you all of these settings about locking the meeting, um, and different options to uh, to mute people. Um, playing a sound when somebody joins or leaves can be very distracting, but I guess if you're waiting for somebody in particular to arrive, it might be helpful. Um, and yet yeah, the option to lock the meeting as well. Take care with your timings. So it's quite hard to know when you're running stuff online, how long it's going to take, because you can be very really used to how it would run in an in-person setting things like discussions tend to take a lot well they tend to take a lot longer because managing a conversation when only one person can talk at a time um it means it's very polite and people are like putting their hand up or putting their hand up through the chat or asking a question in the chat and it comes to like when you're when it's your turn but it does mean that it's not quite as flowing as a, a conversation as you would have in person. So that those things can take longer. And then there'll be other things that you just breeze through that you thought were going to take a long time. So just make sure you've got something going somewhere that tells you how far you're in and how much you've got left to do. Um, so yeah, and that's the that will bring you to the welcome and the rules. So what what I've done at the start, um, and obviously you would do that in a normal in-person event, but I think some people are, like forget that you need to do that when you're online as well. So for the welcome, and it's kind of a code of conduct and um, the risk assessment that I'll send out also has a suggested code of conduct with it, which again, you can adapt and you can send that out prior to the event so people know what's expected of them. So introduce yourself, um, any co-hosts and presenters that are uh, with you and the purpose of the session as a whole. Tell everybody to stay on mute um, and again if it's a large event you might just take away the um the ability to unmute themselves a smaller event you might allow a little bit more discussion um, and for it to be a little bit more free-flowing tell people how they can ask questions and comment if that is something that you are allowing so using the chat function is a, the easiest way of doing that telling people whether to have their cameras on or off um, again, a smaller event um, or a discussion group, it's better to have 
people's uh, for people to have their cameras on if they're comfortable in doing so. Um, but the larger events, I know there's quite a few of the larger events that I've been to where they actually tell everybody except the presenters to have their cameras off because it can be a bit distracting and it's what part of what contributes to Zoom fatigue is having so many different faces and it's our natural um, instinct is to, to look at people's faces and to try and work out what they're thinking and doing. So having that for 100 people can be exhausting. So yeah, if you've got a very large event, ask everybody to turn their um, cameras off, but also warn people if you are going to be recording and give them the option of turning their cameras off. Um, because yeah, if you're going to be, if you're planning to upload it to a public, uh, a public platform, then they need to have that option. And introduce any other tools you'll be using. So I talked a little bit about the Jamboard at the start, but because we're going to be talking about interactive tools, um, I didn't go into it in great detail. But yeah, introduce anything else that you're planning to use during the event. Um, see a question just coming through. Is there a tool for managing time and seeing how far you're in? Um, there probably is. Um, and I know on PowerPoint, you can have a timer going. I just use my phone or my watch, literally I'm a Luddite in many ways. <laughs> so um, I'll quite often, if I'm managing it for somebody else, actually if I manage it for myself as well, I just have my phone on a timer and I might have set times that um, to go through. So for example, some of the meetings that we have where there's multiple people giving updates, they might only have like three or five minutes. So I'll just have that set repeatedly. So that I just use those, um, but yeah, you can have that. You can actually embed a timer on PowerPoint. Any other questions on that before I move on? No, good, okay. Thanks guys. Okay, so looking at interactive tools and we're doing really well for time. <laughs> um, so yeah, sometimes just keeping it simple is the best way. And especially if you've got a small group, just use the chat and ask people to, to chat in there and you can ask them, they can chat to each other. But it, obviously if you're using it for questions and answers, then you probably want to steer them away from using it for just open discussion. Um, but yeah, sometimes just the simplest tool is the one to use. So don't overcomplicate things if you don't need to. Um, sorry. Um, Justin, I will look at how to embed a timer in PowerPoint and um, I'll let you know. I know that when you're doing it in presenter view with multiple screens, it comes up automatically, but I have seen people embedding it, so I will work out how that is done. Um, so yeah, use chat if, uh, if it's the simplest way to do it, just use that. And think about your audience as well. You're going to over confuse people if you're using lots of multiple tools. Having said that, we are going to use multiple tools because I'm going to show you how to use them. <laughs> so you can use quizzes as well. So this was um, uh, what's whose skin is this quiz. Um, and I know that some of you here have run squizzes squizzes online. Um, so pictures, sound or polls. Um, for sound, if you're screen sharing, each platform has a different way to for you to play the sound from your computer. So for Zoom, when you go to select screen share and you select which screen it is you're going to be sharing, can you all see the presentation? Yes, I can see it. Yeah, okay, cool. Sorry, the green square has gone from outside around the outside of it. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, so yeah, when you go to press screen share, um, you can select there's a little box that you need to tick that says share computer sound. Um, and if you're in screen share already, then there's three dots at the top and you can select it through there. But um, otherwise, it can be quite hard to hear the sounds. And for polls, I'm going to share a poll with you now. So um, you should have a poll that's come up um, on the screen and it should ask you which interactive tools have you used. Um, so if you, you can select multiple ones. Oh, that's great. Okay. Um, and just so I can find out which 
things you guys have used before, either again as attendees or as um, as somebody running an event. I'll give you uh, another few seconds. Oh, sorry, I had set it. Oh, I set it so that. <laughs> I did set it so that you could answer multiple, but then I changed the quiz, so it's has to change it. So these are all really good examples of how not to do the things that I'm telling you to do. <laughs> so yeah, so for things like the poll, you can set it so you can choose multiple choice, which I had done, but then I had edited it, so it obviously went back. But it's, yeah, an example of how not to do things. Um, so I'll end that poll. Um, and share the results so you guys should all be able to see that so uh, yeah you've all obviously said you've been the first one that you've chosen but it's nice to see that some of you have used different things before so that's good um yeah moving on simple um so jam boards and padlets um so we're going to go back to the jam board and um, so if you can all go and have a look and we can see, I will share that screen just one moment. So if you haven't been able to access it, it should show you. <laughs> Somebody's been playing with the pen as well, so that's great. So yeah, so it's, there's a few different things you can do with it. You can use the stickies. There's um, tools along the side. There's a laser pointer. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's. I think it's quite handy. You can do it anonymously. So most people are logged in as anonymous. Um, and if you want people to put their name, like Nick's put her name, then you can put it. But you can also, um, I really enjoy just seeing people, whatever they're doing. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can do it anon anonymously. You can highlight things. People can interact with, each other on there so you could have somebody asking somebody else a question um uh, yeah so I think it's really it's a versatile um tool and it can be used by quite a few people I did um, attend an event last week which was with a google doc that was interactive but I also know that jamboard if there's a lot of people on there then it can get quite um it gets overloaded and it stops working so Again, it might just be something, and, and that's something to think about with interactive tools as a whole. <laughs> um, you can upload pictures and stuff as well. Um, but yeah, interactive tools online, like live tools can be um, overloaded, but if there's a lot of people on there. Cool. Um, so Padlets, I have also got a Padlet for you to have a look at. Um, let me just get the link. So there's a Padlet link in the chat. And again, for anybody who hasn't, I really enjoy watching people playing with jam boards. It's great. Um, so for anybody who hasn't um, got access to, to it, I will also screen share in a moment. But if you can access it so you can um, so you can use it as well. I haven't put a question on there, but it's um, again, something that you can, if you want to go and have a play with it, then you can go and see the different things that you can do. Um, I personally, and again, this may be a, a, another case of it being a Teams thing. Um, like I think that Jamboard is more, hello anonymous. I think Jamboard's more um, flexible and more versatile but I haven't played with Padlet as much so it might just be that there's tools and facilities that I haven't found yet um, but you can create different kinds of Padlet um, um, and yeah again it's a free account if you have a free account you're restricted to how many you can have at once so um, but yeah I, it's again it's another good tool to use and it's worth exploring and seeing what uh, what you can use it for and it may be more applicable and more 
useful to, to some events than Jamboard is. And then um, the, the next one we're going to look at is Mentimeter. We've got another link. So. Link in the chat. And there's a code there as well. Um, so I'm just going to find that. Okay, so you should um, be able to go into the link. It's quite cool seeing seeing the results coming up. Um, yeah, so it's a, another live event, um, another live page, which you can see the results coming up straight away. Um, and you can do polls and you can do um, word clouds. Um, yeah. So Again, another thing that you might want to play with. Again, with a free Menti account, you can only um, you can only have, I think, three Menti boards at once, or Menti screens, or Menti polls. I'm not sure. Menti meters makes sense. Um, and um, yeah, I'll leave it there. But yeah, you can do word clouds. You can do polls, you can do pie charts. Again, it's this Mentimeter is probably easier for uh, big events. Um, so it can take a lot like more people than Jamboard can because it's not quite as, um, there's not quite as much to it. And so it's quite an easy polling one. I'm just gonna check your chat. What is Padlet for? Padlet is similar to, to Jamboard. So on the Padlet, you can, um, Again, you can put, uh, so I didn't actually explain that at all, did I? So you can double click anywhere, drag files in, paste from clipboard and click here to post. So you can do a post or you can add pictures. It's like a kind of, for want of a better word, a, mood, a, a better word, a mood board. So very similar to, to Jamboard. Um, I prefer using Jamboard because I'm more familiar with it. But um, yeah, it's just another tool to use, but it's very similar. Okay. Um, and then Google Forms, I'm sure some of you will have used before. I haven't done an example for that because it's, yeah, it's just another, um, literally Google it. Um, and you can do, again, like really simple questionnaires, really simple polls, and you can get um, live results from that as well. So they're just different ways that you can make an event interactive. Try to use them wisely. Um, because, I mean, obviously with this session, the idea is to help to show you how <laughs> to show you them, to show you that there are different things that you can use, but you don't, you wouldn't want to be flitting between different platforms too much in, um, in a real event, like just choose one um, for the session that you're doing, ideally. And you can use videos as well. Um, obviously, there's issues with bandwidth sometimes with videos. Um, and they don't always play very well. Um, I will put in the post event um, information, I put how you would embed a video into a presentation um, rather than trying to play it straight from YouTube or something. Um, but yes, I will put that into the post event stuff. But with videos, just think carefully as to whether it is the best use of, if that's the best way to get something across. And sometimes it is, um, but, it can be so dependent, the quality is so dependent on bandwidth, it's not always the best choice. And so I'm just going to check the chat. How do you do word clouds or whatever they are called? Um, on Mentimeter, um, they've got the option for it. So if you're if you go on to Mentimeter, um, I think it was the previous. So at the bottom, um, there's a see, I don't know how to do it now. Word cloud. Sorry, guys, I did get this all this sorted and um, it's not quite working as I expected. Um, but yeah, there was, um, 
you should have when you got the link to the Mentimeter it should have brought up the poll and then the word cloud or the word cloud and then the poll so um you should have been able to put three words in and then it would come up with the word cloud here but obviously that hasn't happened so I'm not sure why that is okay no worries thanks Kate sorry um yeah that's grand thank you um okay um so yeah final thoughts um as I say it's not can't tell you how like exactly how to run an event I can talk you through different tools that you can use and and things that, to bear in mind but actually you're only going to really learn when you're doing it yourself but hopefully some of these things are useful for you to think about and as I say if you are planning to run one or planning or like setting one up and thinking about what platform to use or how to do it best then please do get in touch um definitely if you want to know about security and stuff then I'm happy to help in any way I can if I don't know the answer which obviously as you can tell I don't always know the answer um I will try my very best to find out for you so um turning off your self you can be really helpful um I am in, in a meeting I have to turn off self you I, I just otherwise I look at myself the whole time and that's just a natural thing apparently everybody does apparently everybody does it um, so if you're presenting and recording, unfortunately, it does cover your face all the time. So, um, yeah, turning off self you can be a very helpful tool to use. Allow time for questions, whether that's throughout the presentation or at the end. Um, if you're running something, if you're running a talk where you're not planning to have questions, then that's fine. Just let people know. Um, but yes, if you are planning to have them, decide whether you're best to have it throughout. So like a training session like this, it's best to have them as you're going through so you can address things as they come up. And um, if you're having a talk from an expert on something, or maybe you're talking about their career and how they got to where they are, then it might be best to have the questions at the end. And just one moment to check in the chat. Um, Yes, running a rehearsal is definitely a good idea. Um, and I promise I did that, but I hadn't had some, I didn't have the things like the Mentimeter in place at that point. Um, but yeah, running a rehearsal is a really good idea. Um, so I uh, quite often, Jen and I will help each other out with that. So we might go through, you don't have to necessarily do the whole thing, but certainly practicing the different tools that you're going to be using. Um, but I would also advise you to, on your own, go through it by yourself so that you know that your timings are okay. Um, Self-view, just you, um, when you're looking at the screen with all of the pictures on, um, in the top right-hand corner, there should be three dots and you should be able to click on those and it should say hide self-view. That is in Zoom, you can't do it in Teams. Um, and I don't know about Google Meet. Um, Practice with your tools. Yeah, as you say, Nicola, definitely have a practice and make sure that you're happy with it. Inevitably, things will go wrong anyway, um, and you'll think you've got things sorted, and then you'll change something and it will change. Um, but practice with whatever platform that you are using, make sure you're comfortable using it before you run something. Um, and as I say, with the interactive tools, a lot of those I haven't really used that much before. So it's trying to give you an idea of what you could possibly use. But really, until you're actually trying it yourself, it's and, you know, using it on a regular basis is how you get to know how to use them properly. So, yeah, but have a practice and get comfortable. Expect the unexpected. Um, yeah, things go wrong. They always do. Um, just laugh off mistakes. I laugh at myself all the time. I make mistakes all the time um but yeah just own them they happen um and yeah that's it so that is um the online events um has anybody got any other questions so it comes to quite an abrupt end <laughs> yeah if you have got any other questions please do feel free to put them in the chat um this has been recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube and I will um, share with you guys um, all of the notes I put together with some useful, with links to all of the, um, uh, all of the different tools that you can use, links to all the platforms that you can use um, and uh, any like useful information and the questions I haven't been able to answer here. So yeah, please do, if you've got any questions you think of afterwards, please do feel free to let me know. 
and um, I will endeavour to answer them as best I can. And if you do want a hand, if you've got, um, if you're setting up something um, or planning to run something and you'd like some advice or would like to chat about it, please give me a shout and I'll be happy to help. And um, so yeah, thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, this is the last training event of um, the year. Um, we do have uh, our Christmas quiz on Thursday. Um, it's fully booked now. So um, uh, yeah, so we will um, be running that on Thursday. We have um, more events coming up in January. We'll have some training from um, Jen from our Youth Engagement Officer on how to engage with young people, from Brenda, our Academy Officer, on how to link um, like educational work with curriculum. So if you're running an outside event, how you can link that to the curriculum for schools and colleges. Um, and we're also hoping to have a session on, um, an, on exact training to run a specific marine plastics educational session. So January is to do with engaging um, with young people and with children, with schools. Um, so yeah, have a look at our newsletter, which will be out tomorrow. Um, the link is in my email signature and keep an eye on our social media and we'll keep you updated there. Thank you very much for coming um, and yeah, hope to see you again soon.